All right, we are live on the show today. Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to another episode on the show. And tonight we have with us in the studio, Dr. Chemezie. Well, we'll call him Star Dog. So I'll leave him to introduce himself. And today we're just going to be talking about his experience in the UK, uh, studying an MSc uh, public health. I mean, I've been getting a lot of questions. What is it like? to study MSc public health in the UK and all of that. I'm like, I didn't do that. So it's better to bring somebody who has gone through that pathway and be able to share his own experience so that we can all learn from that. So that's why we have him here today. Baba Jide Alamo, I can see your comments. Hello, good evening. It's good to have you here. So without wasting time, I'll just pass the mic to Star Doc to introduce himself. So yeah, Doc, let's meet you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good evening from this part of the world. Uh, good morning, wherever you are. Good, good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Shemeze Ibe. Uh, I'm a medical doctor, aka Star Doc. And uh, yeah, I'm a medical doctor. Uh, currently, I, I have a, a master's degree in, in public health. And uh, also, I work with the NHS. At the moment, I went to medical school in Nigeria, University of Port Harcourt, and then I think after after a while, after my housewarship and the NYSC, I did residency in internal medicine, and after that, I left Nigeria for the UK for a master's in public health. So that's uh, that's uh, just a brief overview of who I am. Of who you are. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, well put and. A very succinct uh, explanation. So, why public health? I mean, why did you choose to go and do public health? Was there any special thing about the public health course? Okay, so uh, my decision to go into public health was uh, was fueled by okay, my my passion to provide health education for a large uh, population. And after I graduated from medical school, my first exposure to clinical medicine was my housemanship. And I did notice that a lot of the diseases that people died from were preventable. And I felt I had to find a way to, you know, talk to people about the disease so that they prevent them from, prevent themselves from coming down with the disease. And so for me, I am, quite gifted in poetry, arts, music. So back in Nigeria, I started using music as a tool for health awareness uh, creation. I did songs on uh, hypertension, diabetes, cervical cancer, uh, even COVID, you know, female genital mutilation. So I, I did a lot of songs along that line, and I put them out in the social media. And surprisingly, the reception was very good. I got yeah. reposted by Tunde Note and a couple of other blogs. So it now became something I was doing very frequently. You know. So after a while, I thought to myself that this is an aspect of public health, yes. But I also did not want to be uh, that person who did public health awareness creation without uh, a certificate to back that up. So I felt, okay, get a master's in uh, public health so that when next you want to address public health issues, you're you are, you are talking about this issue from a professional point of view, not just the guy who is a doctor who sings and who is interested <laughs> in education, you know. So that's that's what, what fueled my, you know, my decision to take a master's in public health, you know. And uh, I would say in addition, Apart from that, the master's route was a very easy way to move out of the country, you get. And at the time okay. I left the country, I had just my IELTS, you know. So, fine, you love to do these kind of things. Why don't you get a certificate to back it up? So that when next you talk to people about public health interventions, you're talking from a professional point of view, you know, and you'll be good. So that's why, that's what fueled my drive to do public health. 
Okay, so looking at the course now, in the whole, I mean, from hindsight, you're done with the program. What was your experience? What was it like? Was it tough? Was it challenging? Because sometimes people ask me, uh, what's schooling like? I say, I, I don't know, really. I have no idea. So, I mean, having you here now to talk us through what the course was like, is it tough? Is it demanding? Is it different from what we have back home in Nigeria? What was it like generally? Okay, so um, from my own experience, I mean, everybody has different experiences. So from my own experience, if, I was, if I'm was, if i told to describe my public health masters in one word, I would describe it as challenging. And challenging, not because it's something that is too difficult, but challenging because of a number of factors. First, you move in, you move, move out from Nigeria to the UK. It's a different culture entirely. It's a different learning structure entirely, and uh, the mode of assessment is also different. And coming from a very clinical, like a highly clinical background, being a doctor, I felt that public health. I did public health in med school. I felt that my clinical knowledge was going to come to bear. Yeah. in the study of public health. So, but then it, I was, I was disappointed that <laughs> it wasn't that. I mean, people with zero clinical background would come into the public health uh, sphere and, you know, do amazingly well. For someone like me who had a clinical background, I was trying to replicate my clinical knowledge in public health issues, and that was a wrong yeah. approach. And I suffered for it. You know, wow. yeah. So it took me, um, I think, up until my second, the second half of my study, wow. to understand what was required of me, and then I picked up, and uh, thankfully I finished. I finished the course. Yeah, <laughs> you finished successfully, right? So yeah. I mean. That word challenging it, I think it's very, very, it sounds very serious actually. So, I mean, if we're going to drill down, what was, what was really the challenging or the most challenging part in terms of, was it the, I mean, like you said, the way they assess you guys is mm -hmm. different from what they do back here uh, okay. in terms of maybe essays and all of that yeah. was, how did you navigate that okay. pathway? So I would I would mention the challenges and I would I would mention my how I navigated them. So first is the teaching method. I found the teaching method different from what it was in school in, in Nigeria because in Nigeria it was basically face to face learning. The lecturer is there, sometimes reading out from his notes and all of that. But for the first two to three months of my learning, because we came in when COVID was still COVID was neither here nor there. You have to yeah. do quarantine. So the the um, the legislation then did not permit face-to-face -face learning. So for the first two to three months, the teaching was online over over Zoom. It okay. wasn't something I was used to. Now, the assessment too was different in the sense that Back, back home, the kind of assessment we had, especially with med school training, was, was largely the reproduction of information. We've told you this, or let's say uh, this artery navigates blah, 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 and the rest of them. Describe the cause of this artery. You are just describing the cause of that artery. You have a clinical scenario, management of diabetes. It's, it's just one thing they expect you to say. Yeah. I'm going to do this, do this, do this. This is how it presents and all of that. So it was more or less give me back what I gave, what I gave you. you. understand? But here yeah, it's different. The assessment is in essays. You get essays of you know, 3,000 words, 4,000 words. For dissertation, you write about fifteen to 20,000 words. You know? So, and there's something called level 7 writing. It's, it's a critical writing. A type of writing where you uh, you analyze an issue 
after you analyze the issue, you look at the body of work around that same issue. You look at people's opinion about it, those that are for it and those that are against it. You look out for gaps in, the, in that body of knowledge that you are assessing. And from there, you bring out your own conclusion or you, you, you bring out a statement based on all of all this. So it's, it's something that I wasn't used to. You know, you have to go look for literature, read all the literature, you know, summarize it, get the key points in there, then uh, bring out an opinion from that, identify knowledge gaps, you know. And also, uh, they had another thing here where they check for plagiarism. There are yeah. apps for checking for plagiarism. They call it Tonitin. I didn't, I didn't know that existed back in Nigeria. So I just typed my project then, this period binding, and uh, submitted it. <laughs> so I'm sure, I don't know if they check that project now for similarities, because I don't know what it will, it will read. Maybe over but, 100. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. But, but yeah, for every work you write, you put it in that app. And it's, it gets scanned for similarity. If it gets a certain point, you get, you, you, you are filled, you know. So this was something that I wasn't also, you know, used to. Then, of course, there are cultural differences. There are cultural differences, financial challenges, trying to meet up with work and school, paying your house rent, paying the remaining part of your fees, you know, then also too, I think I, I, I did face some bit of racism here and there from within the within the classroom, from outside the classroom. So a lot of all these things were a lot for me at the time. But uh, thankfully, I was able to, you know, navigate those things. And this takes me to the second part of your question. How was I able to, you know, navigate yeah. that? Yeah. So... For the academic part of it, I was lucky enough to meet an old friend from university days who graduated, I think he graduated from healthcare management or so. Okay. So so he, he reached out to me and said, uh, how are you doing? And I said, I'm fine, I'm rest of it. He said, okay, uh, how's studies? I told him I was struggling because as I then I had failed half of my courses for that semester. And he gave me the essays he wrote during his time as a student in Swansea University. Yeah. And what I did was read his essay. So I read his essay. I just kind of understood the pattern in which he wrote. You know, understood the pattern in which he wrote, how he analyzed issues, how yeah. he, he brought, you know, different literature together and brought out a central message from them. So I read the first essay, I read the second essay. And, uh, and I got an understanding. So from that moment, when I started writing my essay, you know, I started doing, you know, well, but well, you know, that's that was how I was able to, you know, I, navigate that one. For the assessment, so the first essay I wrote, it was a informative essay where they don't. Um, is unless they, they, they tell you to write for testing. Let them just test you. Okay. So I wrote that essay, and my plagiarism score was high. So I got a zero in that wow. essay. I got a zero in that essay, and they told me my plagiarism score was high. That it was similar to a lot of works. So it was then someone told me about an app they called uh, Grammarly. Okay. So with, with the Grammarly app, you put it on your laptop, you write your essay, and it helps you, you know, correct spelling errors. It helps you with your referencing. It also helps you with the uh, paraphrasing. And you are able to check the perceived similarity of your work to over 10,000 works written in the world. Mm -hmm. okay. So what that did for me was that with, gra with that Grammarly app, I could tell that uh, 
if if my work has less than 10 percent or 50 percent similarity i know that i'm good i put it in, i send it back to them and turn it in and that never happened again so that was how again. i you know, navigated that one i mean so that's that for the cultural shock i just linked up with a lot of nigerian people you know people of similar thinking people of similar ideas people of similar color people who understood the challenges you know yeah we had we just had an informal support group ourselves you know for racism you just have to toss that off your shoulder and sometimes you actually have to stand up to people and say no you can't do this this is not acceptable you know sometimes mm. i was i had to bring one guy uh, in my class then that see i i pay I pay, I paid my school fees out of pocket. I don't owe the school anything. I don't even owe you anything. So you're not going to come here and talk to me in a manner that is disrespectful. And that was how I addressed that. So for some, you just ignore and you know move on with your life. That's about that, really. You know. So then, okay, that's cool. Uh, when you were talking, you talked about paying bills or and all of that. So, I mean, how did you survive that phase in terms of what kind of jobs were you doing to survive? Also, bearing in mind, I think this uh, student visa restriction on, I think, 20 hours a week or something. So, how did you yeah. get by? Okay, so I would, uh, I would say, like, I... I consider myself quite lucky because first of all, before I left Nigeria, my father sponsored my, my master's degree. So I didn't come here on scholarship, or I would say I was on my father's scholarship if I would use that word. <laughs> so, so the money he gave me paid, I would say over it was enough to pay 100% of the school fees, but I knew that I had to also set out money for rent, you know. So that money he gave me was able to cover like, I say 80, 85% of my school fees. Okay. Then, and my rent for the first few months, say three okay. to four months thereabout. And the thing is this, when you come into the UK, I don't know about most people, for me, I couldn't secure a job you are likely not going to secure a job in the first month. You might secure a job in the second month. And by the time they do all the checks and security checks and all the checks yeah. and everything, it would have entered another month. So by the third month, you see that the money you came with from Nigeria, of course, you also be spending Naira for that first few months because you are going to be changing it to pounds in uh, <laughs> what they call it, at black okay. market rates. Wow. You understand? So I'll say I got very good buffer for the first two to three months of my of my stay here. But after that, I now had to start, you know, looking for jobs to be able to pay rent, to be able to, you know, pay the remaining part of the small part of the school. I think it was about three thousand left, which is also big money, you know. That's significant. Yeah. I had to because I was not paying it every every other day, hundred pounds, two hundred pounds, and the rest of them, you get. So, the first job I did here. The first job I did here was I worked in a care home. That was the first job I did in Swansea. I worked in a care home, and I would travel from Swansea, from the central part of Swansea to one place they call Clanekly. It's like an uh, an hour and a half on the bus. And because of poor transportation, the first bus usually left around, say, 7.05. So you have to be at the bus station before then, you know. And we'll ride, go there, walk. Then in the night, I'll still come back. So that's the, the job I was doing initially. But after a while, I had to quit the job because, first yeah. of all, my shifts were starting at 7.00. And this is like one of the problems of being here too. Like you also have to be very careful with the job they give you. My shift was starting around seven, but the first bus leaves at seven oh five. And it 
an hour and a half trip. So what that meant was that I would perpetually be late for those trips. Yeah. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So I con complained to the manager, why don't you give me afternoon shifts? Why don't you consider school and the rest of them? They were not being considered. So after a while, I, I had to quit because I was also scared. Being a doctor, you could do something in a care home and it would be taken to, down to GMC. You get That was my fear. So I had to quit that job and left that. And after a while, I got another job in a restaurant where okay. I was I was the kitchen potter. What kitchen potters do is they wash plates, they wash cups, and they clean up the kitchen, clean up the restaurant. When everybody goes, they clean up everywhere. They set up the security light and eventually go. Now that's that's one job I consider because it was a six floor restaurant. You know. So that's one job I consider very, very hard. Reason is that as a kitchen potter or someone who is working in the hospitality industry, there is no room for you to sit down. I don't know, have you seen any waiter sitting down? Or <laughs> the barman sitting down? Or yeah. the chef sitting down? There's no room for you to sit down. The guy at the bar that is washing the place, there's no room for you to sit down. So if you are doing an eight hour shift, it's eight hours on your feet. Wow. Yeah. You know, and the kitchen is a very hot place. They're right before, beside the corner. So everywhere is, is very hot. And we have peak moments. Fridays are peak, time, peak periods. Saturdays, okay. that's when people come to eat, come to drink. Then midweek is another one, Wednesday. And for whatever reason, those were the days I got. Your own shift. So I will resume at 6 p.m. and sometimes go back home by 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Because yeah. even after eight hours, you can't. No, I... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Mm. Yeah. So I said some when I, my shift starts at six PM because that's when the rest of people, you know, come in and all of that. During the day there's nothing more that happens. So six okay. to like uh, two AM. Six to twelve is six hours now. PM is eight hours. But then sometimes you can do extra hours if there's so much to do and you haven't cleaned up you're not gonna leave the place. That's wow. You know. Then that was another job that I did. Then after a while, after a while, my my first semester results came out and I I failed like half of my courses. So I I reached out to I'm struggling financially. I'm also struggling with my academics and the the, the consequence of this is that if you fail a second time, you'd be thrown out of the master's program. You get. And I had plans yeah. lined up as well. So so he asked me, okay, how was he able, how, how was he going to be able to support me? I'm like, I feel like the next three months I should just visit and focus on finishing this this coursework and writing my receipt. That way he did was still look okay, I should forget about working for that period of time yeah i'm going to handle my rent and whatever whatever small money i had saved up i could use it for my feeding so that in three months i would have finished up my coursework and yeah. sorted out my receipts you know so that came in very handy at that point so, it, so what's, can you hear me yeah i can hear you yeah go ahead so apologies, guys, uh, for the network glitch. Uh, we are back on air. So, yeah, we're still talking about how you're able to, you know, manage your finances. Uh, I think you stopped at the point where you said your first semester results were out and you had failed and all of that. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I had, I had failed those first semester courses. 
and uh, I took solace in the fact that okay, I also passed Black One in that period, so it, it didn't it didn't pain me so much. But yeah, I knew okay. what the problem was because I didn't understand the system at the time. I was trying to still understand how things were going, and I was also struggling with the jobs and all. So I I I reached out to my elder brother, who at the time told me to quit work for a while and focus on getting off my second semester results out and also yeah. uh yeah taking off my second semester and also passing those receipts so within that period of about three to four months he he took care of my rent and i um i had to handle my feeding and you know other other things you get yeah yeah so once my second semester finished now after second semester what is left for you is dissertation and your physical presence is not needed in dissertation except you are doing something in a lab in the uni okay. so i selected a topic that would even if i was in nigeria i could stay on my laptop and do that topic and do it okay yeah, yeah. so i left swansea for london and i picked up a job as a nursing assistant or healthcare assistant. It okay. was a Bantu role. Here, yeah, when they give you jobs, they classify you as in bands. I don't know if band one exists, but I think the lowest <laughs> I've seen uh, is the Bantu role. So I was working as a healthcare assistant at uh, Royal Free Hospital, working with the nurses, as assisting them, checking vital signs, cleaning up patients, dressing their beds. Just those kind of jobs. And one thing I did was I didn't let anybody know I was a medical doctor, you know. Wow. Because okay. there was no need for that. I would just do my job, go back home, ask questions. Okay, teach me how to check this. What does this mean? You know. And that money I got there was able to now start paying my rent in London and feeding okay. me. There was no room for any saving. Wow. It was just there was no room for any savings. Like, go out there, walk, pay your rent, eat, go back there and walk. So, if I didn't walk, I would probably be out on the streets. You get? Yeah. We but, are live on the show today. Hello, yeah. everybody. Okay. Yeah. But, wow. But, but I, I took up that rule because somehow I knew that in London I was going to get something better. So it was easier for me to get something better while in the city than staying in Swansea. And hope that was five hours away, and hoping that someday I'll get something better. You know, at the initial stages, it was quite challenging because I would leave. It, like, it was like I was doing the Nigeria. So I'll leave Swansea by night bus, come to London, walk, enter night bus, and go back to Swansea. Mm -hmm. You know, it became very stressful. So so wow. stressful that one of my friends, Emmanuel, reached out to me and said, "I think." You should come and stay in my house for this initial period. That way, it will help you save some cost, help you also get involved and know how to arrange yourself. You know, so I did that job. While I was in that job as well, I was also doing some locum covers as a healthcare assistant. So a lot of times I traveled out in different parts of London. Some of my friends felt I was enjoying because I was trying, they didn't know that I was actually <laughs> going to different places to go and, and work. But one thing I learned from those kind of jobs, those jobs, they teach you humility. You know, they teach you humility and you can't disrespect people. It's, it's like they're giving you a position of trust. And some of the comments I, I got from doing that job, I still remember, I was even talking to my mom about this. I remember one patient told me, oh, you're so respectful. Have you considered going into nursing after this job? And and I told her that well, the future will dis decide whether I will do that. But she was saying that because she felt like I was doing the job with so much compassion that she felt yeah. like I deserved more, not knowing that I was even a doctor. You get. So I did that job for a while, and along the line, one of my friends called me and told me that. 
that in the UK that there was a role called medical support. It was for medical doctors who did not have GMC registration. And uh, okay. if I was interested, it could link me up. What it means that you'll be working in the clinical area with consultants, with other doctors. You do everything that you do, but you're not going to prescribe. But they are going to pay you as good as they pay doctors. Interesting. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So he gave me that idea. And I'm like, fine. Just send me the link. They sent me the link. And I, I interviewed for the role. And something, something miraculous happened at that interview. I had a black guy and a white woman at the, in the board. So they asked me, walk me through your CV, tell me what you're doing, tell me this, 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 and that. Like, listen, they asked me about some clinical scenarios. I talked about that. They asked me just general questions and said they've gone through my CV. And they said, okay, if we want you to start, when do you see yourself starting? And I said, I'm ready to start immediately. I currently walk <laughs> just down here and I need to give them one week notice. So they were like, okay, we'll get back to you. And the black guy said to me, Floret. And I said, Floret. Now, Floret is, is a slang that we use back in King's College. Okay. You know? So it happened that he went through my CV and saw that I was a case college boy. You know, and he was at the head of the employment panel. And he said, Flora, I said, Flora, and they closed the interview. At that point, I knew that no matter what, I was going to be considered for that role. Someone I had never met before. He went to King College like seven, eight years before I did. And two days later, I got a mail that they had taking me that I should show up for uh, induction training and blah, blah, yeah. blah, and all that stuff. I showed up and that's, for me, that was my, my break, my major break financially. I, I rented a bigger apartment or a bigger room, let me put that way, closer to the hospital. And I left where I was. I just gave them, you know, they said, okay, you have to do two more shifts. It was on the day I was going and I'm not informed by the other nurses there that I'm actually a doctor. I've gotten another role and I have to leave. Another. Yeah. We're like, ah, there was this woman from Portugal, a black woman. From the first day she saw me there, she just, she's in her 60s or, or, or 50s or whatever. She just liked me. I'm like, black people, we need to support ourselves. Anything you don't know, please don't do. Don't get into trouble. If they ask you to do this and you don't know, come and call me. I'm going to do it. I see you like a son to me. I see you are hardworking. So when I eventually told her, she was like, wow. That she just knew that there was something about me. You know? So that's how I left that and moved on to being uh, working as medical support. And okay. it became, that was, for once in a very long time, I felt like a medical doctor because you would go to the ward, you're going to see patients, you're going to document for, just like the regular house of stuff that we do back in Nigeria. Yeah. Documents. You know, they will write the prescriptions and they will engage you in clinical stuff. They will do clinical teaching. And I was paid more than the FY1s and FY2s. Wow. Okay. So it was, it was good money for me at that time. So I did the job. It gave me access to consultants. It gave me access to the hospital. It gave me access to doctors. It gave me access to materials for PLAB2. Because PLAB2 is largely clinical. Yeah. You know? So, and I started doing the role as well. And by then, I had passed my receipts. I had passed my, my second semester as well. I had dissertation left to do. You know? And I completed that role. And somehow, within that role, I now became, like, the, I was now involved in training new people. So when they get new people in, I was involved in training the new training people. Training them. Yeah, getting them on board. I I was also able to provide links to some of my friends. And they got jobs in the same hospital. They are the same means. So okay. we, we now got there. We also formed like a very small 
community you know, community of of friends and people who you know from there i got my blab to study partner and we wrote our exam too and passed and that was how that one went but while i was in that job i i would say i made good impression to the best of my knowledge anyway and when i got my gmc registration the i resigned from the role and they called me to come and take up like a doctor role yeah yeah like three four days after i resigned from that role and and that was how i also changed from you know being a, a caregiver to being a kitchen potter to being a healthcare assistant and nursing assistant to being jobless to being medical support worker <laughs> now to being a doctor a in the uk a proper doctor you know and completing my msc so that's like that's the that was the journey for me but in all of this thing i would say that i had good support from my friends and family friends who came in here with skilled worker visa who were already doctors and the rest of them Sometimes i would call i said i beg please eh, i'm trying to do this this and that give me 200 pounds i need to sort out this issue i'll give you back so for every time i needed maybe a place to borrow money from there were people who were willing to give me and give they gave me because they knew that i was going to pay back at the day i said i'm going to pay back pay back yeah you know sometimes it gets overwhelming and i call my parents say ah so you go have i'm coming to your place in coventry let me just come and rest from all this madness like okay fine you know and one thing about here is that if you're in the UK, traveling to other European countries is cheap, is easy. So there were times I had to also, I made use of that opportunity, got visas, Schengen visa to Spain, took a trip, less than 100, 200 pounds. And, you know, I came back too. Still here, got, got an American visa as well, you know. And for me, I, I put traveling as a key part of my you know, distressing technique. Technique, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's that that was the, the journey for me really, you know. So I mean looking at the plot part now, so how were you able to, you know, manage the whole preparation, writing the exams yes. in the middle of the masters and all of that? I'm trying to imagine mentally the the type of pressure you would have been on. How did you, you know, get around that? So I would say that you remember I told you that I, I did fail some courses. Yeah. And I was looking back, that's a blessing in disguise, really. Because what happens in the UK is that if you fail a course in first semester, you have like I think about two to three months after second semester to rewrite those courses. You get. Okay. So that gives you like a window and a course that you failed, you already know what you have to do to pass this time to around. Pass, yes. So that gives you like a period of nothingness. A period where you are doing nothing, really. Imagine someone giving you three months to write a 3,500 word essay that you have written before. All you have to do is, okay, change this, change this, change this, put this and all of that. So I had the time of, you know, actually doing nothing serious. And I still had to work 20 hours a week. So you see that I had like even 20 more hours of free time. Okay. So I put that into my PLAB. So this is what I did. Before I came to the UK, I was already studying for PLAB 1. Because I got my, I came to the UK August, September. Let me say September. My PLAB was November. Yeah. So I had September and October to prepare. However, before that time, I was already studying for it. So when I came into the UK, that last two months were for me to consolidate and you know finish up my last preparation for that plan one. And this was the time I failed the courses for first semester. So it was mm. more like let's sacrifice something. There's a, an option of receipts in two months. But with plan one, if you fail, you can you may not get date till another one year. Yes. So I put a lot of energy while using one year to be listening to the masters most. 
he gets. <laughs> so I passed the plab one, filled part of the master's. I'm like, okay, let's go and get the receipt. So I quickly did my receipt. It got me some time again. Then I started studying for plab two. After my second semester. But okay. I, I, I didn't pass my first attempt at lab two. And I would say for me, the reason was that I had been away from clinical practice or anything clinical for a long time. Damn. So the med, it was, I, I failed that exam just before the medical support job came. So, and I entered into medical support job. What I was not doing was purely clinical work, see patients, talk to patients, how to do this procedure, how to do blah, 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 and the rest of them. So I made use of that opportunity to learn on the job. While I also, you know, went through my materials, went through some videos. There's a video I used, one doctor LCD video. I used that as well. Then my work partner in the job was also preparing for PLAP2. So mm -hmm. we kind of linked up and started doing intense study group. So in October, I took good the thing is that the medical support also helps you secure PLAP dates straight from oh. the GMC. Wow. Okay. Wow. So if you're doing if you're working as a medical support worker and you have PLAP2, they're going to pay you for that exam you are going to write. They see it as a, it's a day of work. They will pay you your money for that day of the exam. They are also going to call the GMC to secure a date for you. So you are going to open your portal and see that there's a date available to just you. To go and write. And, and for you to go and register. And the GMC will write to you, you are where you're a medical support worker, check your portal, this, this, and that. You have your dates waiting for you there. Whatever date wow. you choose. Wow, nice. You get so those were like some of the the benefits that we got from apart from that the, the job also gave me that hands-on experience you get mm -hmm. so by the time uh then my dissertation has started i spread my dissertation because because i had the receipts my dissertation did not start when my other people started so i had like a prolonged time to do dissertation so i fixed in my plab two in between went in wrote the exam and passed. I wrote in October, passed in November. By December, I submitted my, my dissertation, you know, and by January, I had the job from that. So, summarily, I would say it's, it's a lot, yes, but with planning and strategy, it's also very, very achievable, really. I'll tell anybody, if you are coming to do a master's, have your IELTS already. Let's say you have your IELTS already. Before you come in, start preparing for your plan one already. Start preparing. So that when you come in, in a few months, you write your plan one. When you do your course, because coursework is really very intense. Yes. But let your coursework finish. The moment you finish your coursework, there's a time for dissertation. By the time you and your supervisor are going back and forth with topic, no topic, proposal, no proposal. Let's wait for ethical approval. That ethical approval can take one to two months. Yeah, okay. So use that period and maybe do your academy or study for your plan too. And by the time you, you now come back from the exam, you continue your project. By the time you are submitting your project, your plan two results is ready. It's out, you know? yeah. And you, it's, I mean, it's for me, I feel like being strategic, being intentional, and uh, you know, planning these things. With that, it's it's, it's very very Doable. achievable, and it's I was able to get a job like real fast after the exam because I was already in the system. Yes, as the medical support stuff, right? Yeah, I was already in the system. I knew consultants. I had a good relationship with my line manager. Uh, I had a good relationship with the nurses, with my colleagues. I was even already teaching people really doing PLAB2 in the same hospital. I was already preparing them as well. Okay, do this, do this, working together with my lab manager. So 
I was just one day, I opened my email. My land manager has recommended me to a consultant. That I, I think these guys are good enough. Me and another person, these guys are good enough for this vacancy. Mm. Consider them, interview them. Mm. And I mean, that word alone, for someone to say, ah, see this guy, let me send up. Mm. It's almost like, ah, Strong recommendation. Yeah. That's it. You know. And I, I did the interview. Of course, before the interview, what I did was the girl who worked in the row, the girl who worked in the row is a Nigerian girl. Okay. I went to meet her. I'm like, okay, during your interview, how did it go? What's the structure? What did they ask you? You know. And she she just told me, okay, during my interview, they did this. They asked me this, they asked me that. You know, the major cases we see are this and this in this. Thing. They asked me the management and all of that. You know, lo and behold, when the interview came, not like they asked me the same questions, but I already had a, an idea of how to approach you know, the direct my answers. You know, one of them was just what they asked her, then the second one was totally different. Of course, okay. I'm sure they switch these things to be sure whether you are not a robot. You know, <laughs> you know, they can't be asking you maybe something about palliation now. They are going to talk about uh, neutropenia and all the rest of them. So that's it. <laughs> so they changed it, and I also answered this simply. Then they also start asking some common sense questions. So even questions. Though, what's your? How do you think? You get and. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I answered it, and after that, I went about my normal business, and they they called me. You get so that's that's how I was able to you know navigate that part as well, really, hmm. with the plug. It's quite interesting, you know, because some some people uh, usually are worried about them, you know. How am I going to be doing the MSc and still preparing for Plab One, Plab Two, and all of that? So it's good to know that it's really <clears throat> something that is doable, right? Then, yeah, I think the last question I'll have for you is: I mean, are there, though you mentioned a couple of points, mm -hmm. are there any tips that you want to, you know, share for you know some of us who might be considering? uh coming to the uk for msc and hoping to transition to you know doctor work and all of that yes i mean i think the first tip would be to do dreadlocks <laughs> 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 just do that that's so that you know that ah we're coming to fight to <laughs> it's, it's a mad zone <laughs> anyway <laughs> so Sometimes people ask me, okay, why did you, why did you, why, why do you have dreadlocks and all of that? That I just laugh because for me, it was like I started keeping my hair at the point where, man, I was really, really struggling, you know, with work, school. I was going crazy, and I'm like, you know what? Let me have go bad hair for self. Let me focus on this, and you know, this is just on on the lighter note. But really, yeah, I think um, the tips I'll give is. You, you you first of all you have to you have to have a plan you you have to have a plan what is what is your plan really because do you um it's not enough to carry your bag i'm leaving let me go to the uk or let me go to this country uh, we'll find a way around it no yes the plan might not be 100 percent sure but you should know that okay once I come in here, I want to write this exam. I want to write this exam by so and so time. I'll do this, and you know, I should be able to transition. That's one. Financially, you also have to have like, like a good amount of money to support you for at least for the first few months. Like I did tell you, my father gave me hundred percent of my school fees. School fees, yeah. Yeah, and a little extra. And what did I do? I spread them with school fees and house rent for a while. You get. And within that while, I started looking for jobs. Somehow, I was able to pay up and, you know, sort myself. So, you also need to have, like, a good 
financial plan. Don't come here hoping that you will raise fifty percent of your school fees from from work. Reason is that there's a job work restriction of twenty hours. If you do more than that, you put yourself at the risk of not getting a visa renewal. You understand? So mm -hmm. now at that twenty hours a week, it means that your earnings are capped. You can't go above a particular limit. So most of the money you even have might just be going into rent and feeding. Like I did tell you, there was a time that every money I had, once I go out and work, that and get that 800 pounds, 900 pounds, 650 goes into rent. If you take out 650 from 900, what is left? Nothing is left. 250. Yeah. You are going to you are going to buy food or make food for the next one month. Before you know it, at the end of the month, you have 70 pounds left. You have to go back. So is it that 70 pounds that you're going to use to raise over seven, eight thousand pounds? <laughs> no, that's also not possible. So I would also tell people, see, the moment you get here, it's important that you start looking for a job that will give you sponsorship after your stay or after your study or towards okay. the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. Because the rule. The rule before now, I don't know if that has changed, but it was like you should have done at least, uh, I think, seven to nine months of studying before you can switch. But I heard that that has even changed, that you can switch from the next month if you have someone who is willing to sponsor you. To be that sponsorship. So you start looking for those kind of jobs. Talk to people. Your greatest asset are human beings. Talk to people, get information. Tell people to show you, teach you how to answer interview questions. Go f if you are looking for a job in the hospital, look for those small, small rules. Because it's easier for you to enter when you're at the door already. Mm -hmm. It's easier for you to enter when you're already at the door than for you to enter when you are far away. And that's how I entered. I went as a nursing assistant. I got close, close, close to the clinical area. Then went as medical support, got even closer you know, to the uh, clinical, uh, to the patient area. And now, I'm where I am. You get, that's, that's another, this thing, I would, I would, I would say. Collaborate. I think he's gone off a bit. He should be back soon. Hello, can okay. you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, please. Yeah. Collaborate with your people. And lastly, for the academic part, which is very, very important, I would advise that if you come in, if you come in, uh, look for people who have done the course before. Those of your people that have done the course, ask around, people who have done the course before, ask them to give you their previous works. Be able to, once you read those. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you, go ahead. Once you read those works, it should be able to guide you. Then among your classmates, man, form study groups and and pray too. That's what I have to say. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, you need to you need to cover everything with prayers. Let me see if there are any questions from anywhere. Check in here. I can't see any questions. So I mean so um, it's been an interesting conversation so far. And I mean, my takeaways from this conversation is uh, the first thing is to have a plan. So you don't just uh, start living Nigeria without a plan or living wherever you are without a plan. So it's good to have a plan. Then uh, sort out your finances very well before you move because that's very important. Then I think you also mentioned the, the importance of having a good support network. Please, you mentioned you had people who were, you know, always available if you needed to borrow 100 pounds or 200 pounds. So those friends and that network is good. Then, yeah, you mentioned um, asking questions. So information is key because apparently, I mean, <clears throat> it's only by asking that we, we get the information we want. So you need to always 
ask questions, then network with persons, collaborate with people, then uh, I mean look for people who have you know gone through that journey to ask uh, how how they did it and uh, how they managed to get around the whole obstacles. Because I know it's not um, it's not an easy thing, you know, leaving Nigeria and you know coming to settle in a whole new environment all by yourself like that. It's um, <clears throat> it's a tough one, but it's good we have this uh, conversation. At least I think it gives a lot of, of uh, perspective into as to what happens out there because I think a lot of persons don't have this. Uh, information because some people think it's all rosy and glamorous and all of that but <clears throat> from it, it's very very <laughs> from your narration is very very far from it so thanks for coming on to this so if you guys are watching from linkedin or twitter this stream will still be on my youtube channel so you guys can um, always come back to watch it and probably maybe there are a couple of things you missed and all of that so i know there was a break somewhere but i'll try to merge two of them together into one complete video so that you can okay. watch yes uh in one sitting right um i think that's it for tonight so until next episode guys uh we'll see you soon bye for now uh, thank you very much for for having me all right and i really appreciate this session all right now so can i